have that 80% certification snapshot count. Um, so it's just a, a note here that for dual enrollment grant purposes, you may never actually meet your 80% certification requirement because you may never have a snapshot count out there. But in case you do, um, this is just a reminder that that 80% is required. It's recording. <laughs> it's recording now. now. Okay. Yes. So getting into, sorry, a little side comments going on over here. James forgot to hit record for us. We, That's okay. <laughs> we missed the first eight minutes of the session. Nothing, uh, nothing emergent, I, I believe, was missed. But when you um, start the recording, anyone who may miss this know that you missed the first eight minutes. My apologies. And I can send out my PowerPoint too for everyone so you'll have it. It's it's not a big deal. Um, verification um, for dual enrollment is the initial enrollment information. So if you don't require verification, um, this would be just skipped on to the certification process. But under rosters in FAST, there is a dual enrollment verification link with when you click the verification link, you're going to choose an academic year. Your school is going to auto populate. You would pick a term. You can filter this list out by high school if you want, and you can filter out by application type as well. Um, you may choose to leave it all high schools and all application types and then you would click on the verification roster at that point on the verification roster new applicants um when you enter a gpa it's going to be 0, 0.00 Obviously, you know, new students aren't going to have a dual enrollment grant GPA. Um, the new renewal applicants, you're going to enter a cumulative GPA for all courses the students have attempted while they're receiving the grant. And again, it is a cumulative GPA for courses at a two year, four year institution, along with any TCAT courses that they have taken. It's a cumulative. The students must earn a 2.0 GPA to remain academically eligible. And there is a verification indicator on the roster. If students have only taken TCAT courses and they don't have a GPA, they have a continuation grade on their transcript, um, there is a verified override GPA option for those students. Again, that is for the ones who have the continuation grade on their transcript from a TCAT. Um, if they have other courses that they've taken under the grant, other than a TCAT course, and you've got the transcript to verify that, you would enter that GPA and can continue without that TCAT course. So once verification information is entered, um, you're going to click save and it's going to give you a note that records are successfully saved. My suggestion is to clear your verification lists. You don't have to. If students aren't enrolled, um, you do not have to clear them. But clearing the list is a way to ensure that you've not missed any students for payments. Um, just kind of a checks and balances process. So once you have saved your verification list, the students then move to your certification roster. So for certification, you're going to again, you're going to go to the rosters tab in FAST. You're going to choose certification. Again, you can pull some of this down. Um, by going to choose the aid program, the academic year, your institution will auto populate. You're going to pick the term you want to certify. And just a reminder that 
terms must be certified in order. So you can't certify a spring semester student without their fall semester having been certified first. The high school option defaults to all high schools and the application type also defaults to all. Um, if you are working on a specific high school that day, you can pick just that high school. Or if you want to go through and get your new students um, certified quickly because you don't have to enter a GPA for them, that may be, you know, choosing an application type may make those things go a little quicker for you. But once you um, <clears throat> once you enter that information and then click the certification roster, it's going to populate that the roster for you where you're going to see the information. Obviously, you're going to see only students that are at your institution um, that, or that have your institution listed on their application. It's going to give you their social, their application type. You would enter. A certification indicator. It does give you some data information on these students if they've been paid prior to this term. It gives you the number of courses they've been paid and how much they've been paid or the clock hours. Some of the certification options are certified, which would be your eligible student that you're going to pay. An ineligible would be for different reasons. It could be um, that the student isn't enrolled anymore, but you may want to choose the not enrolled option. Um, those are not permanent ineligible reasons. The unsatisfactory progress is a permanent ineligible indicator. It's going to keep the student from being eligible the, the following semesters. Appeal pending, if a student has submitted an appeal um, to continue eligibility, you can use that option. If the student um, made it through maybe your verification steps or if you skipped verification and are moved on to just certification, you can use the not admitted. Um, one of the TCAT certification override options um, with that continuation grade on their transcript is this certified override GPA. You're going to use it just like the, the verification option of um, <clears throat> if the student has that continuation in no actual grade on their TCAT course. So when doing certification, um, new students you would enter a zero GPA on those students. Um, you would enter the number of courses that you're certifying. And under the institution type, you can, if the student is taking more than one course at your institution, you can leave it um, listed at your institution for all three of those. But if that student has a consortium agreement, um, with another institution and you are the home institution, you would list the other institutions that the student, where the student's taking those additional courses. This does not send the money to the host institutions. This is simply a way of tracking where um, the student is taking those other courses at, and you would still be responsible for using your institutional's institutions policy um, regarding those consortium agreements and how you pay the students the donor the dual enrollment grant funds. The award amounts are going to default based on either the clock hours if it's a TCAT or what course number the student is on for dual enrollment. Um, the, the system again tracks that, so it's going to default to the award amount based on the course number. If for some reason the student's award amount is less, um, if they have a, a teacher discount or a state employee discount, something along those lines, or if your cost isn't what the default amount is, you would want to reduce that um, to whatever their tuition and mandatory fees award amount should be from that number.
So certification um, for renewal students does require the GPA, um, whereas the new students did not. You would want to enter a cumulative GPA for courses attempted while they're using the grant and be sure that you have confirmation of what those GPAs are. We are not requiring that you have an official transcript, um, but you do want a transcript from any institution that a student has taken dual enrollment courses through while they are um, participating in the dual enrollment grant program. Any certification indicator used other than certified is going to gray out some of the fields. So you would only be required to enter a GPA, um, just as a side note there. When doing certification, you're going to have pages, probably multiple pages. Um, at the end of each page, it's not required that you click save. My suggestion is that you do, just so you don't lose it if you have to step away um, or if you get a phone call and distraction in the middle of certification. If it times out on you, it's not going to save your information. So again, my suggestion is at the end of each certification page, you click save. But once you have completed all certification, um, you'll want to click save and pay at the end. This sends TSAC a notification that your institution is ready for those payments to be processed. So the next payment date, Joe will know to pick up your payment in the process of things. If for some reason you finished it all and you're like, oh, I didn't realize I'm done um, and you don't have the save and pay option anymore, um, you can still send TSAT notification to say, you know, hey, my school is ready for my dual enrollment grant payments to be processed. So if you don't have save and pay at the end, it's not the end of the world. You can still say, hey, TSAC, I'm ready to be paid. That is an option. So after payment um, has been processed, like I said earlier, you will receive an email with um, the payment date and the ACH information. If you go to system in FAST and then again to your school profile, you click the aid program, the academic year, you will be able to see your payment history. And this is going to be payments for your school um, that have been processed by Joe. When an ACH is available, she will um, or someone will enter that ACH information onto your payment history. And once that has been done, once that ACH information is entered, a reconciliation roster um, will generate at that point. So adjustments can be made at any time uh, once a payment's been processed. If for some reason you need to request additional monies for additional courses or return monies, um, those adjustments can be processed with without any issues other than after the end of the academic year. If you need a step-by-step walkthrough of how to process, you know, any adjustments. If you'll let me know, I do have um, that step-by-step -step available and can send it to you. Um, but just know that if for some reason you need to request additional funds or send monies back, um, adjustments can be done on, on those payments. There are a few reports available to you all in FAST. So students that have submitted a dual enrollment grant application um, can be found on the application report. If they have your institution listed, you're going to see them all. So under report, activity, scholarship, and then the dual enrollment application report, um, this list can be filtered by the high school. So if you want to see just one high school you may be working at, um, making sure their students have submitted applications. This is a way to 
ensure students have done applications on time. If you're working with, like I said, with a specific high school, you can pull up their list and um, if they've given you maybe a roster of students who are enrolled to, to compare it against, this is a good way to ensure that students um, have submitted those applications by the deadline. And again, it does give you some, um, some information as far as what a student has received in the past and how much they've been paid or what course number they may be on. There is a student application information report. This is basically just the logistical information on um, students that have submitted applications to your institution. It's going to give you their name, their addresses, um, their email address and high school names. Under the rosters tab in reports, there is a payment roster and a reconciliation roster. So the payment roster is going to give you um, all of the students that may have been picked up in a payment file for that day. You may end up with 10 different rosters depending on how many payments you may have processed. Um, but for whatever payments do or whatever students get picked up on that roster for that day, they are going to appear on the payment roster. Once an ACH is tied to your school's payment history, again, that reconciliation roster will generate at that point. You may see other reports in the system that may allow you to pull data for dual enrollment. Um, at this time, those reports are not going to give you accurate information. So the only ones for dual enrollment that are going to be accurate and give you all of your correct information. It's either going to be the reconciliation roster and would give you all the students that have been paid, or it would be this application, um, application report. And again, that's going to give you all the students that have listed your institution on their dual enrollment grant application and will give you their payment information once they've been paid as well. One other thing that I want to share um, that not everyone is aware of is that you have the ability to update student application information. If the student has your institution listed, you can pull them up under the Social Security number quick view. If you click on the update scholarship record, you have the option to update like their address. Um, you may update their citizenship status or their residency information. You can update their high school information or an ACT score. What you cannot do and what you would still need to contact TSAC for if there are problems are the name, social, and the date of birth. Those things are linked to the student's portal account. So those can't be updated by the institution because TSAC has to fix the errors on the student's actual student portal account. Again, if the only way you're going to see these students, though, is if they have listed you as their institution on their grant application. Just a quick note about consortium agreements. Um, they are necessary when students are taking courses at multiple institutions. Uh, so this agreement is between the home institution who is listed on the grant application itself and then any host institution. What this agreement does is allows you, the home institution, to request the additional funds for the other courses that the student is taking. As the home institution, you would use your institution's policy for refunding and dispersing the funds once they're received. Now, whether that's cutting the check to the student to pay the host institution or if you pay the host institution directly, that is up to you and your institution's policy. 
So a couple of sources for more information. The Help Lincoln Fast has a few things that you may want to look over. Um, they're under award rules and charts. You can see a chart of the dual enrollment grant amounts um, and a list of eligible high schools. And there is a FAST system user guide there as well. Under program rules and policies are the lottery policies and procedure manual, which does include dual enrollment. The Tennessee code for tells, which again includes dual enrollment and the, the lottery rules. There are a few of those that are being updated um, based on things that have been submitted and, and signed off for new programs. Um, so as soon as we have confirmed rules and policy updates, those documents could be and will be updated in the FAST system. If you have new users at your institution that need access to FAST, um, there is a school user request form under the request forms link. There you're going to find the retroactive payment request form as well and a change of institution um, document. We do prefer students to change their institution via the student portal. However, we do still accept the change of institution request form. Two other things are an employee directory and um, there is a residency guide if you have questions about um, Tennessee residency and whether a student is eligible or not. Can we pause for a moment? Yep. So we have, uh, I have, I promise I've been monitoring questions and we, we actually have two that are related to the consortium agreement. Okay. I think I know the answer and I believe you've answered, a answered it, but I still wanted to ask the question so that it was directly addressed in the transcript. Uh, and Robert may chime in. I feel like this is something we talked about in the fall on the road as well. Um, in the future, could the money be sent to the other institution instead of both grants coming to the home institution? And that, that's one question. And the, the second question is worded differently. I believe it's basically the same question, but I'll ask it as well. Is it possible to have consortium funds sent to the other institution in the future? It would be extremely helpful to not involve our bursar accounting and other offices. Uh, so I believe our your statement here, the consortium agreement answers that question, uh, but just to, to have it on the transcript. Is there why can we not do that? I think is more the the best way to answer the question. Yeah, this is a, a discussion we've had in the past uh, with schools. Can you stay muted? Stay muted. Okay. How's that? Yeah, and then talk. All right. Uh, yeah, this is a, a conversation or discussion we've had with schools uh, over the past uh, couple of years. Um, and, and this is an item that we can definitely uh, uh, work into our uh, process. We haven't yet due to the legislative updates, but to pay multiple institutions for the same student in the same semester has been a, uh, a goal of ours and, and uh, it is on our product backlog list. So what he's saying is that by the time some of us retire, it might be something that we can happen <laughs> fast to, to put it in other words. Uh, but for the product backlog list is our list of items that we'll, uh, we are planning to work at some point in the future. Uh, as we always like to say, if there's something you want to see change, specifically in this area, call your legislator and tell them to stop making new programs and we might actually get some of these things fixed, right? Um, while we're while we're answering questions, so we did have a couple folks earlier when you mentioned if folks wanted like walk through step by step stuff. We have had a couple folks had mentioned that, so I'm going to email you their names. It's like Charles and um, Miss Cersei. I'm gonna I'm gonna let her know that both of you guys are, are looking for that. Uh, so Fred McClanahan asked. Uh, please explain how an employee discount might affect a student's dual enrollment grant. It, it wouldn't uh, uh, impact it one way or the other, except for the fact that the dual enrollment grant award amount cannot it, it be awarded in excess of the student's cost. Uh, there is no there is no language in the, uh, the rules or policy that that 
stipulates that uh, dual enrollment grant can be awarded along with uh, other types of discounts or scholarship. Okay, so likely the employee discount would be awarded first. It could be. Yeah. And then, so that would lower the cost of the tuition and then the remainder of the tuition would be met by the DEG. Could be, yes. yes. Okay. And then uh, Michelle Brown, and this may be, um, we may need a little bit of clarification. Both Robert and Jana may know exactly what you're asking here. I'm not a dual enrollment person, so I'm clueless as to most of this. Uh, we are looking for a report to balance all the students who were certified but have not been selected for ready to pay. So is that the, would that be the audit roster? Does that function in the same manner? Okay. It does not function. Okay. Um, if you pull the, If you pull the application report, you can export this report and filter it by the term payment status. So if you were looking for students who are ready to pay specifically, you could pull those out based on that um, term payment status. Um, I think what you're asking is to compare of if who is waiting for payment as opposed to has already been paid. Is that what I can assume with that? I think, um, but this report will give you and you can filter out based on their their current term status. I think so. And uh, Michelle, if if that. OK, and if, if that doesn't, if you need to expand on that, you're welcome to unmute if you wanted to to ask any clarifying question. That would be awesome. Okay, we have one more question and I, I think I know the answer, but again, I'm going to defer. So. OK, thank you, Michelle. Uh, this is from Annette Bohannon. Um, can the student update his or her name? I believe the answer is no because of the way it impacts their student portal account correct correct so okay. if a student's name is spelled incorrectly um that is something that tsec does have to handle um as far as updating on the student's record because it does impact their student portal account and um those have to be dealt with as well so unfortunately just correcting a name uh, date of birth or social is not something a student can do for any of the programs. So we still delete, I'm typing the response. We still delete the portal account and then ask the student to create a new one, correct? Correct. Yeah. Simply because the name is tied to the portal. Yes. Annette, if you want to just email me um, those yeah. students, I can get their information corrected on their yes. application. Yeah, I put and it would be the same Annette from a promise perspective. If it's related to Tennessee Promise and they misspelled their name or their social, we would we get those often from whether it's from the POs or from the, the schools uh, where we're having to create a, you know, they transpose two two letters in their last name or two numbers in their social or any of those things. So awesome. Okay. A couple of things uh, I, I would like to address uh, sure. back to Chris question regarding the uh, discount. Uh, uh, a student that has an employee discount, it, it would be, be more beneficial uh, to use an employee discount because the dual enrollment grant award amount is the actual tuition uh, yeah. cost uh, for courses six through 10, uh, where the award amount is $100 per credit hour. Uh, employee discount would serve to uh, reduce the out of pocket costs in, in that uh, yeah. circumstances. And, and the other thing, uh, that I want to address. Jenna mentioned the uh, consortium agreement. I am uh, uh, working through a consortium agreement specific to the dual enrollment grant so that schools won't have to use the uh, Hope Scholarship. I think I understand as well, uh, TBR uh, will present uh, a, a consortium agreement. My thought on that is that 
you if you choose to use your own consortium agreement for the dual enrollment grant program, you're welcome to do so. We'll provide an alternative uh, to that where a student is enrolled in in more than two uh, enrolled at more than two institutions within the same semester. Uh, the uh, consortium agreement that we'll provide will allow up to four institutions. I understand there are a few students who might enroll in four institutions within the same semester, not many, but a few might, and this consortium agreement will allow for uh, a student to use one document for all three or four uh, institutions. And I will have that available uh, for use very, very soon. OK, so I believe our presentation is from from Janice's perspective, her presentation is concluded. So if oh, we have another question here. Um, does it matter if a student's grants are certified out of order? Uh, Danielle, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I can. I can understand how it happens. Um, if for some reason a student was enrolled um, in the fall semester but got certified or verified as not enrolled for some reason, and then um, the spring semester they've transferred their institution um, to another school, and that school has already certified for payment for the spring semester, let's just say, then upon realizing that um, the student was actually enrolled at your school for fall, you come back in and certify for payment. We have had the situations come up where the student's order gets messed up and it only really matters when it's courses six through 10. So if, if a student's at five and six, um, possibly with, with two different institutions, we have had instances where um, I've had to go back to the institution for spring to say, this is what happened. Student was actually enrolled, should have been paid in the fall. Um, we'll need you for spring to create an adjustment to refund part of those funds. So does it matter how the student is paid as far as ordering of the course number? Yes. Um, can it get mixed up between semesters when a student does a transfer? Yes. Has it happened? Yes. Um, but we can go in and get those fixed with adjustments um, and communication with, with the institutions involved. If that doesn't answer your question, Danielle, and we need further, um, if we need to talk about it, you can just shoot me an email or call me. You hit the nail on the head with that one. Uh, <clears throat> another question. May students take two dual enrollment courses through one institution? Yes, um, the student can take up to. Five courses, 10 courses in a semester, I mean, I don't know if any dual enrollment would would enroll in that many courses, but we don't have a limit on the number of courses a student can take in a semester um, and be paid for the grant any longer. And the limit is just 10 courses over their mm -hmm. lifetime. Uh, of grants. Good deal. Hey, are there? Uh, we're we're not finished just yet. We have a few more minutes. I was going to turn it over to Josh. Um, I'll keep my eye out for the chat. Uh, Josh Moran was going to jump in. He he did share. He did not have a presentation per se. He did have some details on some um, upcoming programmatic system functionalities. So uh, I believe Josh, you are set up as a presenter so you should be able to unmute and take off okay good good y'all can hear me okay y'all can't hear me we can hear you i, I can oh, hear okay. you yes <laughs> okay all right uh but thanks everyone uh so yeah my name's josh moran uh i am here to talk about a couple of the things that we have planned for deg in the upcoming year thanks everyone uh first I'll give an update on DEG batch certification. Um, we started working on this uh, for last year. Uh, some of you may remember us uh, talking about it at one of the TBR DEG meetings. Uh, we do have the first portion done. That's the, the download file from FAST, um, but we haven't completed the upload portion. Uh, we had to stop to work on a couple of things uh, this year. 
probably the same things y'all are updating or working on too. Uh, we hope to get back to it this fall, um, but I did want to go through and talk about a couple of things on batch certification, just a tip. I know uh, this may be a new kind of process uh, for uh, people processing DEG, especially if it's done in an office outside of where TSAA or HOPE is processed. And so what this upload process, download process is going to do is allow you to get a file from FAST. Uh, you'll import it into Banner or whatever system that you use. Uh, this file will contain the same list of students uh, that's on your certification roster for that term. And along with that list of students, it's also going to tell you how many TCAT courses versus non-TCAT courses the student's been paid for previously. So you should be able to work out how much money that student can be paid uh, for that next term at your school. And the idea is that you're going to take uh, rules, conditions, uh, that you and possibly your IT uh, develops. And you're going to update that file that you imported into your system uh, and create an export file. Uh, you send that back to FAST, and that automatically is going to update all your students on that file and certifies them if you had done it uh, manually. And uh, another thing to bring up about that file, very important use for it, um, that importing that batch file is also a very useful tool when you're awarding DEG. Um, and, you know, hopefully you can set up some type of automatic awarding uh, because, you know, if you think about it, who are you going to award DEG? Uh, it's probably going to be anyone who's on your cert roster or a verification roster. That's the students who's going to be on your import file. How much are you going to give them? Well, if, you know, if the upload file tells you the student's been paid for two non TCAT courses, and they're taking two courses uh, at your school, uh, like everyone in here can tell me how much money they're going to get for those courses, right? You're going to just have to tell your system the same type of logic, and hopefully it's going to do that for you. Uh, just a question, I see it popped up about if it's going to be available for non-banner schools. I, so the functionality inside of FAST is available to anyone. The same thing that works for like TSAA or HOPE now. The problem is to use these types of processes, um, it takes a lot of development work. So, you know, luckily TBR schools can rely on TBR to go through and do that development work. But for that part of your system that will import it, update those files, uh, it's going to require that you or someone at your uh, school or uh, probably someone in your IT department develop those processes to import it into, you know, if it's banner, power fades, AMS, is that one still being used? Uh, any of those types of things. So it will be something, you know, it's an investment in time and actually works out pretty good for uh, transitioning me into my next point on there. So they're not, batch processes by themselves are not uh, this automatic savior that's gonna change your life. Uh, if you've never done them before, they take time to learn and develop. But uh, if you can put in the work, learn them, it can do a lot of the certification work for you and free you up for all those other duties as assigned. Um, and I know it's hard for y'all to spend the time on it. Uh, probably all of y'all have dance cards that are always full every month out of the year. But if you can become involved, oh, I will start working on this. Uh, Hopefully we'll be able to get back to it later in the fall, all depending on, uh, like I know some of you may be aware of and working on too, the FAFSA simplification, how that works out this year. But yeah, won't be available this fall, but we hope to get back to it this fall. Um, but, you know, as soon as possible, uh, you know, if you're able to work on this, um, uh, become involved with it at your school. If the system is working on it, you know, you'll want to volunteer uh, with it, uh, help and give input on the development of uh, those processes. Because uh, one thing I want to bring up about it, uh, I think DEG is probably processed more differently amongst the schools compared to like uh, HOPE or TSAA. Probably a lot of you process those programs very similarly. So, you know, during that development of whatever you have to do locally to, to import those processes and use them, uh, you want to be prepared 
because if you're not giving that input, you may get a system that works for how other schools process DEG, but not necessarily yours. So uh, important thing, uh, uh, make sure when that comes up for the development work, which hopefully sometime in the next calendar year from today, uh, no promises. I may have jinxed myself with FAPS or simplification, but it's an important thing to keep in mind. I'd also recommend start, uh, not now necessarily, but once we get closer to the process, you can start talking to people who do TSAA or HOPE at your school. Likely they're using the batch processes and they'll give you um, an idea about uh, what may be involved in setting those up at your institution. Uh, some of the other notes about the batch certification, it also works for verification. Uh, so remember, those are largely the same processes in FAST. It's just how you divide up the population if you do both. Some will be on your verification roster, some will be on your CERT roster. There's no uh, need to develop two different technical processes, though you, you will uh, uh, need to, have, uh, to be clever about how you split up that population if you're still doing certification and verification. And opportune time also, because my next point in there, I think someone just put a question. Uh, we do have in that functionality for the upload download it, to start giving an option to download rosters earlier in the year. Uh, similar to, I believe, reconnect, we may do that. And so I think that's one thing everyone agrees with. As we go through and touch uh, certain programs, we'll make the same update that uh, possibly give you access to those rosters earlier in the year. You can't upload them, but you can download them. Uh, the second thing that we have planned, and uh, this one may be answering some questions that came up earlier, is that um, we have updates planned to allow a student to specify more schools on the DEG application and to allow each of those schools to certify for that term. And this would be the situation where a student may be attending uh, multiple schools and uh, each school on there will have the potential to go through and certify that term in this way. If they're attending more schools, that money will be routed to those individual schools that did the certification. And so how this will work, uh, the student can apply. Uh, they can specify up to two additional institutions on the application for a total of three schools. Uh, hopefully this should be sufficient for most situations, but if it's needed, we have plans to allow someone at TSAC to allow another two schools, up to five total. And then how it will work is that we allow each school, uh, depending on how many that student specified on the app, to certify that student for the term. It has to be done in the order that the student listed the schools. First school certifies first, second school, and then the third. Uh, and the certifications have to be done in that order. That student will not appear on the roster until the pre uh, of a subsequent school until they've been certified by uh, a pre all previous schools in that uh, list where the student specified that year. Um, and just you know, a couple of notes about how this will work out. Um, so, uh, if you do have a student who put multiple uh, institutions on their application. Uh, they're not going to count towards your 80% requirement on there. It's only, you know, whoever is the first school. But those schools, uh, or those students, I'm sorry, those students, uh, you do get the, the certification credit towards reaching your 80%. So they don't figure in the denominator, but they will figure into the numerator type of thing. Uh, we will have reports uh, to help you identify your students who specified other schools uh, and where uh, you are in that order. Uh, the school list and order will also be on the batch certification file when you import it. And uh, we'll do this so you can import that file or you can review the reports to tell which of your, uh, which other schools your students are attending uh, in case you have formalized um, concurrent enrollment agreements. Um, you know, for example, um, maybe you run the report or you import that uh, batch file. You see that you have 20 students who specified two or more schools. Uh, that batch file will give you uh, which schools they are. So you'll know out of your 20 students that maybe uh, 10 are attending a specific institution. 
that maybe you have um, a standing uh, concurrent enrollment uh, relationship with. And so you have a certain way that you'll process them. Your other students who are not with your typical consortium students, maybe they'll get like a, a generic consortium or um, letter giving them instructions on if they want to be paid for more uh, classwork. And uh, so uh, this update's meant to give you more flexibility for how consortiums are handled. Uh, we are not taking away the ability for one school to certify coursework for multiple schools. That's gonna stay. That's the, the current situation. One school can pay for multiple schools work. It still goes to one uh, school. This update is going to allow multiple schools and whoever certifies, if they certify for those funds, uh, those funds will be sent directly to them. And so uh, just an example I have here. So an eligible student fills out the application. They specify two schools, Nashville State uh, Community College in the first spot, TCAT Nashville in the second spot. Nashville State certifies uh, the student for payment and the student now appears on the certification or verification roster for TCAT Nashville. And so uh, after this updates in place, uh, TCAT Nashville then will have two options. Either they're going to certify that student for coursework taken at TCAT Nashville and they'll remove or they'll receive the money directly from TSAC or if Nashville State certified TCAT Nashville's classes instead when they did their own coursework, TCAT Na uh, Nashville would certify with the non-payment indicator and uh, they would receive money from Nashville State for the consortium agreement. So, um, but that's hopefully how it works. Um, I'll go through, I think I may have some questions on there, but. Oh, uh, and let me say both of these processes uh, that I'm talking about, these are things that we are working for in the future. Definitely, uh, you know, we know a lot of people would like that batch certification. So it's, you know, um, it's, you know, assuming there's no fire or flood this fall, uh, hopefully we'll get back to work on the, the batch certification. And as well, as soon as we're able to, we'll get to work on adding the multiple applica uh, multiple institutions to the DEG application, then updating the rest of the parts of the system to allow multiple schools to certify the same term. And that's all I have for today. But happily, I will take any questions. Sorry, Josh, I had gotten distracted. I was typing a response to, to Stacy in there about the uh, high school sophomores receiving DEG. Um, all right, so thank you. Looks like we have a, at least one hand raised, so I'm going to attempt to unmute, or I will ask that person to unmute. That may be the best way to do that. Maybe. Melanie. Melanie, if you go ahead. It's not, Melanie, it's not going to let me unmute you. So if you can unmute yourself, if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. And I'm sorry, we're, we're in new student orientation at Lamont on today. So our admissions team is not on. Did I hear you all say... I was trying to listen in between students. This mm. is, I know it's being recorded. And you're going to send this recording out to everybody? So yes, ma'am, we, we are actually going to, we created a web page, like a landing page for all of our webinars. So we're going to have it on the, the web page probably in the next, uh, give me two days for a little bit of grace. And then we're, uh, we're going to work on the, um, work on developing the FAQ and we'll share that out. And we'll also share a PDF of Jana's PowerPoint presentation for folks. Uh, just as an FYI, I did. Um, I, I'm a professional failure at technology, so I failed to start the recording until about eight minutes into her presentation. So I think you missed maybe the first three slides. 
uh, for anyone that once you get to looking at the uh, the PowerPoint presentation. But yes, we will share the slides. We will develop and share an FAQ based on the questions we've received and then any other common questions that Jenna and Robert may toss in there. Um, and we will make the webinar recording available uh, on our landing page and we'll we'll share that landing page out soon as well. OK, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? I know we're right at our one hour. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, you know, nothing says we have to keep this to an hour, but out of respect for everyone's time, we do try to keep them as succinct as we can. So one hour is about as fair as we can get. I'll just give it another couple of seconds and it uh, looks like we do have a question. Michelle, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, Michelle Brown, and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so will the DEG grant or cover the tuition increase? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, yes, the, so yes. Really nothing's changed. It's just it's gonna we want we won't have to worry about telling students that they owe like ten dollars or something. <laughs> Okay. Well, the the increase will be based on uh, the annual rate increase as determined uh, for community colleges. So okay. uh, th there will be an account for an increase. Uh, uh, it's likely that we might hear uh, that uh, increased amount sometime next month. Okay. Uh, but as soon as we receive that increase, we'll update our documents and and post them in the, in the system. OK, great. I'm just getting prepared. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. And we, we do have another uh, question that's popped up in the chat. Will there be any new communication to the schools, colleges about the increase to the DEG? So, Jeremy, just to clarify, you're, you're saying after we receive notice of the, the rates from the Tennessee Board of Regents, um, will we will we communicate what the new award amounts may be to those that are at private or, or other four year institutions. Is that kind of a, a, a clarifier to your question? Does that does that help answer? OK, so that that's more of his question. So once we know the rates, Robert, will we then share an announcement? OK, yeah. so we'll uh, what we'll do and this. This will tie in some Tennessee promise info as well. So typically I um, I develop like a memorandum that I share to all of my four year private institutions. So and we do that by fast announcement. So what we'll do is develop a, a, a combined fast announcement and we'll share it out for DEG and for uh, for Tennessee Promise. I think Helping Heroes. Do we have this? Do we have something similar for Helping Heroes, Jenna? Or am I just making that up like award amounts based on tuition rates? No, no. OK, no. OK. So yeah, but but yes, for DEG and Tennessee Promise, we'll share that out probably here in the next. It's typically around that first or second week of July, but as soon as we have it, we'll share it out. Okay. Uh, we did receive another question. It's a consortium related question. Our favorite. Um, if a student is taking both credit and TCAT classes at the same institution, even though TCAT is considered separate, is the consortium still required if there is one pr person that processes DEG? for both credit and TCAT at that specific institution. That Chattanooga. <laughs> well, we weren't going to name names, but. <laughs> State is the only one uh, that does this. Yeah. Uh, we say in the, in the policy that a consortium agreement is required. Um, it, it wouldn't make sense uh, that TCAT Chattanooga and, and uh, Chattanooga State would be re required to create a consortium agreement with themselves. Um, that makes sense to me, uh, but that's specific to that answer is specific to uh, Chattanooga State and TCAT Chattanooga. OK, are there any other questions? Give it another minute or so. We've gone over just a little bit. I do appreciate everyone's time. Uh, we appreciate your questions. And um, OK, then. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. If we don't speak to you, have a uh, 
a nice weekend and, and a safe holiday. Thank you all so much.